Dr. Eric Burkhardt is a historian and specialist in medieval and early modern martial arts and especially fight books, right, Eric? Nice to see you. How are you doing? Yeah. Hi, Paul. Thanks for having me. And your, your um, I mean, you range, you go for the full range from um, really old historical research and you, and you approach that through all the questions of kind of modern sociology and modern cultural theory and stuff. But, but your specific interest at the moment is, is the fight books, right? From what, 14th to 16th century fight books, European? Yeah, exactly. That's, uh, I mean, the first documented fight books we have, uh, although they are quite exceptional, so it's a, a 13th century, late 13th century, early 14th century manuscript uh, produced in a, in a monastery, probably. So we don't know much about the context of production of these fight books. But um, yeah, these are just the most fascinating sources I've come across uh, so far as a medievalist. Okay, so so you are a, a a martial arts practitioner and you like swords and you like medieval weapons and you you like all martial arts i guess but so why yeah, did you mo most the... most of them most of them <laughs> I, I don't i don't much like taekwondo actually but uh, that's just okay. a personal taste <laughs> it's, I, I i did taekwondo i i love the high kicks and i love the i, I love I, I, it's a great workout i still now that in lockdown i still go for taekwondo kicks because it's kind of really great workout but you're you prefer weapons you prefer swords right uh, no, no, actually, I have a long history in uh, unarmed martial arts. So I did a lot of karate, but I, I actually my first uh, martial sport was fencing, like Olympic fencing. Mm -hmm. um, but then I took up karate and jujitsu and stuff like that. And yeah, also weapons, which are fascinating because they give you so much um, versatility in training. Uh, yeah. And so now you, you study, would it, 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 everything about the fight books or is it the weapons in particular uh, what is it that leads mm, well yeah i try to approach them as um f the first documents relating to embodied technique of the middle ages so um it's they, they give you lots of information but um i think the most crucial part of these fight books is that they try to to describe ways to use your body in combat so they really they break it like like we we know it from uh, from modern day advice advi advisory literature. So like on combat sports or so, they try to break down fighting the complex structure of fighting into specific techniques. They name the techniques, mm -hmm. and um, sometimes uh, most of them also include depictions of these techniques, like drawn depictions. Yeah. And um, yeah, they 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 are not manuals, so they don't try to inform guys who don't know anything about fighting how to do it um, it's more like they're coming from a professional um, background from from fencing masters or masters of arms um, who try to to well to record them the knowledge um, sometimes to structure their training i guess um, sometimes as some sort of a handout for um, for their pupils so some of these include um, depictions of like um, medieval medieval um, medieval students um, who would have learned this in practice uh, and who then got presented this copy in order to remember the lessons they learned so um, but this is more a noble context so people who could afford this would have gotten this sort of handout thingy uh, and yeah but there are also there are different different variations of these of these fight books so some are, have depictions some have no depictions um, it's pretty much in in the well it's it's evolving very much from the 14th century to the 16th century. Okay, so you you have a, I don't know if your perspective is controversial, but you, <laughs> unlike kind of amateur enthusiasts for HEMA, for historical European martial arts, you have a lot of reservations about what as a practitioner you could you could take from these books and, and, and or what knowledge you could confidently assume or, or, or think that you found, right? Could you tell us a yeah. bit more about your interpretation of the book? Yeah, that, that's difficult because um, I mean, you can you can definitely try to use these manuscripts as sort of um, well, they can inspire your training, I'd say. Um, but so much of the stuff that which is described in there, sometimes it's just names, names for techniques, and you can roughly guess, well, this must be a strike that's coming from above from the left side. But how to to perform this strike, how to counteract it, it's just very very roughly described it's something that you would uh, well yeah it's it's not it's not it doesn't have it's not intended to to instruct beginners so um, it's very hard to tell how they would have thought about this movement in action 
-hmm. and um yeah so i think what you what you need to get this uh, back to life again is so much martial arts knowledge so much training from other perspectives um in order to get this to get this flying again uh so that in the end me as a historian i wouldn't call what i'm doing when i'm taking up a sword and reading a fight book i wouldn't call this really i would call this embodied research like ben spatz talks about embodied research a lot and this is contemporary research so i'm doing something with my body with the artifact and with the inspiration that the text gives me but i wouldn't call this historical or historiographic research because I, there's no way to tell whether i'm right or not so it's it's just making this work for me now but it doesn't give me lots of insight into how the the movement might have been conducted in the past. Um, it's just a, I think it's an epistemological gap. And because the HEMA scene is, well, all they do is read those five books and um, yeah, try to, to make a training curriculum from this. Mm -hmm. So I think the approach is completely different because I'm not interested as a historian. I'm interested in the knowledge structures in there. I'm interested in the way they talk about fighting. They, um, they will, they, 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 how fighting is, is becoming a discursive object for them and in their books. Now, this is my, my prime uh, directive. I'm not interested in, in yeah, doing this. Mm -hmm. I'm interested as a martial arts practitioner, but not, I'd say, this is the, the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde thing in my, in my head. Um, I'm the, the practitioner on the one side and uh, the historian, uh, the, the historian on the other side. Okay, so so you could you could dress in the clothes, you could pick up the weapons, and I could do the same. We could have the same weapons, wear the same clothes, and we might use them completely differently depending on our, our physical capacities and yeah. our own training. Yeah. And that's just the way it is, right? There's no. Yeah, way, but, but this I think this would have been the same in the Middle Ages as well. So I think uh, we have to imagine the practice of the Middle Ages as being very very. Uh, variable so i mean they they also had different bodies i mean we could look at this from a from a time perspective so the bodies in general of modern days well which are formed by labor and by by sorts of well sitting at a desk all the time um, um and these medieval bodies in contrast to this but also at the medieval stage i think this is a uh, technique is just so variable so you would find a teacher who who taught you these movements and another one said well this is complete complete nonsense i'm going to show you how the real thing works and the funny thing is we've got this also in the manuscripts so polemics is a large a large issue in fight books so they would they would complain about masters who don't know uh, how to perform a correct uh, strike and uh, say well what i'm teaching you you will defeat all these guys uh, yeah so um it's just Pretty much the same as uh, internet discuss discussions today. So, so it's it's this, it's a similar structure. So you know, my my instructor is hard tougher than your instructor, yeah, yeah. and we we do this technique correctly, and you don't know. How. Okay, exactly. But but when you say you're interested in the way that fighting becomes a, a, a an object, or the way the way they start to talk about fighting, are you saying that? There becomes a maybe a genre of thinking about fighting, mm -hmm. or it becomes a. Uh, it, it developed its own tropes or its own imagery that could have been different or I mean is there an essential way to talk about fighting is there a different style in the middle ages well difficult hard to say I'd say the the interesting thing for me is that at, in the 14th century and also I mean the, ma the, ma the major part happens in the 15th century so um, th there is a large I think there's a discursive change um, which is also some sort of a media, I would not say media revolution, but I mean, many people who are not in the church are starting to read and write. And um, so in you, you, you have much more uh, records of um, well, knowledge outside of the classic scholastic canon. So, and this is part of this. Uh, so they, people start to write books about fighting. People get the idea that it's maybe a good idea to, to write a book about this. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we're having a large, we're having much more knowledge to talk about from the Middle Ages. And um, well, I think I would not say that there is an essential way to talk about fighting. I think there are um, based on the materiality of bodies and the, the way you can hurt a body in order to render it, uh, well, unconscious or whatever. Um, I think there are some material structures which set different boundaries to the way we talk about and th think about fighting. But I think the, the, these boundaries are so wide that, I mean, yeah, 
there are just a million ways to 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 think about fighting, to theorize fighting, to um, develop strategies to survive or to to win in a fight. Um, I think it's it's yeah, it's so compli. It's as a human interaction, fighting is so complicated um, that you can't you won't arrive at one specific way. Like I mean, we've talked about this already. So this uh, this the idea that there is a real fighting on the street, which is not martial arts nor combat sports, which is the real thing. I think this exists in today's discourse, um, but it's always the the well hoping for some sort of core that you can rely on. But I don't think that this is except for the basic structures. If you if you I mean we have pictures of people people getting decapitated. Uh, I mean if you if you would decapitate your opponent, he might not fight back again. But um, I think that's that's those are the boundaries we can talk about um, how fighting is structured. Okay, so you the, the another kind of unique uh, feature of your approach is that you you kind of embrace all aspects of cultural theory. Like you mm. you'll take you'll take anything from from the most kind of um, disembodied realm or, or of continental philosophy, and mm. if you think that it's going to help you to think about. Uh, like embodied skill and embodied knowledge and, and and so on you you use it right I mean tell us a little bit about your favorite you know what do you get from cultural theory and philosophy yeah well for me cultural theory is just uh, it's just a way to to well to to show how I'm thinking about my subject because the problem of of um, historiography is always that I mean we're making up the past basically so we're, we're here in our discourses in our ways of thinking and doing things um, and then we just take up traces of the medieval past and we, we interpret them and try to, well, try to grasp what has happened there, how, how these things came into life uh, and came into being. And so for me, it's always, I'm thinking in a, in a double, well, I think in a double discourse analysis, you could say, because I'm thinking about the discourses I'm in. So the way I can see the world, I can see, I can, I can well, ask my questions about the past. And then, on the other hand, there is these these traces of medieval times, um, which I'm interpreting in the light of my my thoughts. And if I'm trying to well use all kinds of theory that I can can get my hands on, uh, in order to well to show how I'm theorizing, how I'm on an abstract level thinking about what is my interest in the past. I think this is uh, this becomes a more uh, well, transparent way of doing historical research and transparency is for me one of the key issues of well being a scientist and trying to well to yeah to to, to communicate with people about things that are interesting. Okay, and then the, the obvious the obvious objection to raise. I mean, I, I get this objection too. It's that the theory. This is the accusation. I'm not suggesting mm -hmm. this view, but how do you negotiate the problem of the fact that the theory? And the language and the concepts and, and people would say jargon of theory gets in the way of the subject that you're meant to be talking about. I mean, I, I've I've been accused of this before. How do you navigate that problem of language and terminology? Well, I, I'd say mm, I think this does not apply that much in medieval history, because um, I mean, your all your language always gets in the way between if you if you try to mediate the the gap between our time and the middle ages so you always have sort of a gap to to bridge and um, if i'm using theoretical meta language um, i'd say this just enables me to well to to structure my approach better mm -hmm. so i don't i wouldn't say that this is a problem and most of the time yeah if you talk about people who are really deeply into medieval history um, you have to explain the theory first so what, what do you mean why do you use this I, I try to I try to to show that for me this is not some sort of a religion this is just a tool so this is just if if that's also why I mean you, you said it already so I'm rather using theory ecle um, uh, eclectically so like I'm, I'm picking up concepts and and stuff from different theories um, in order for me, these are just tools. I try to grab my my subject with it, and I try to be transparent while doing this. Um, and apart from that, I mean, I'm not. I I wouldn't say I, I believe in theory. I just think I believe in uh, every way that makes my approach more transparent. 
Yeah, I mean, and thinking about that, I've, um, looking at some of the um, things that you've said and things that you've written, you you are you've argued your sense is that because martial artists really you can't really kill your training partners right which is a good thing <laughs> you can't kill them. So, so therefore martial arts training is like inherently theoretical mm -hmm. because it there's always a, a gap between yeah. the, the that and the verification i think so yeah there's always that gap so so you're you're it's quite a controversial thing so, well people will take this the wrong way mm -hmm. but that martial arts training and practice is overwhelmingly theory-led rather than mm -hmm. practice-led I mean, what do you say to that? Well, this is this is something that also comes from my from my experiences as a practitioner. So I would say, um, I mean, I had lots of these discussions with training partners. Mm -hmm. So if you could really apply the full force and stuff like that, mm -hmm. and I mean, this this gets even more um, in the well in in the front row if you are talking about weapons training because you're always restricting yourself. Um, it's it's really dangerous even to train with blunt steel weapons so um, you would always try to simulate an environment where you could train safely because you want to train tomorrow and the day after that as well um, and i also find these these like hints to these practices in the manuals or in, in the in the fight books because um, they would distinguish between a way of fighting which is um, meant to kill someone so like they always this fighting in earnest is always like the 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 thing or the situation those techniques are meant for or most of them are meant for this but you would also distinguish between fighting in 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 a playful or at least in a training context mm -hmm. or in a in a in a well in a competition in a competitive context mm -hmm. this happened as well so they would they would also distinguish what's what's the the mode of training we're in right now and what techniques do we use for which mode of training mm -hmm. um so i think it's inherent in training practices that you can't train the real thing because mm -hmm. it's meant to, to destroy your opponent mm -hmm. um and you can't train that train that so um and my, my idea is if I read those fight books, sometimes it's like um, these, uh, well, uh, fancy YouTube videos where people show how tough they are and how hard their, their techniques really, really are um, to, to prove that they actually work. So it's, it's, it's lots of this is like uh, legitimizing your practice, showing that it really works. And it's also the same thing as today. So um, they, they would refer to a lineage uh, to a favorite to a famous master so there's Johannes Lichtenau which is one of the first uh, known fencing masters in the middle ages and uh, I mean there's a, a tradition of people writing up lineages relating to him uh, in the 15th century and he's first documented in the at the end of the 14th century mm -hmm. so um, and also in the 16th century they're still using his name and his didactics um, to show that this is good fencing um, so the 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 attempt to to show that what you're doing is good practice is, is a as an auto praxis um this is uh, omnipresent in the middle ages and that's what got me thinking to say well yeah um if they can if they they need well ways to to show that what they're doing is good good teachings and and good fighting mm -hmm. okay so um I mean, there, so you mentioned that there are clues within the fight books. I mean, do these are these visual clues or are these textual clues that say, yeah, you might want to do this if you're showing off or if it's a demonstration or if it's a. I mean, do they talk about it at that level or or do, are, there, are there examples of because these are civilian books largely, mm -hmm. aren't these? Are these it'd be wrong to call them martial arts books because it's not about war. It's normally about yeah. dueling, right? Yeah, it's it's complicated to say because um, how would you train for war? Um, so if you would train for war, it's it's a, um, you try to simplify the the context of application. So even if you train for a mass fight, you would learn techniques in a one on one situation before you bring in more complexity. So I would not say that this is not it's not that the context their training is not war. Yes. Um, but I, I think that people train these arts in order to pre prepare themselves for any sort of fighting that might, uh, that might occur. So, um, but yeah, you're right. So the, 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 the context is always a one-on-one -on -one situation or usually a one-on-one -on -one situation. Um, but you would so sometimes have like um, depictions of people wrestling someone who has a, a large knife wrestling him taking off uh, taking away the knife and then putting him into a sack 
so just this is just for fun this is just for demonstration <laughs> uh and yeah it's it's quite sometimes you have to guess because of the context because you would never do this in a in a <laughs> yeah you would never do this in a real fight yeah. uh but um yeah so you have to to sometimes you have to guess sometimes that they, they say well this is these are techniques which are good for um competitions or these are techniques which are good for shimp so which means not not earnest fighting yeah okay so um how would you explain to um to to the i guess the amateur i, I guess you probably had arguments with kind of amateur hema reconstructionists <laughs> I guess, uh, so you, those are the circles you move in and your position is is one in which it's it's like a different conceptual universe right it's a different mm -hmm. so like for instance we've talked about this uh, together in the past we today use the term martial arts and we can look back at the fight books and we can look around the world and go, ah, martial arts. But we have a very modern, mm -hmm. like it's a very contemporary, actually, 50 years or a few more of the concept of, of, of martial arts as such. And yet people project that back, like that, 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 we, that, that in the Middle Ages they could be martial artists. They, they weren't. They, it was a different spectrum, wasn't it? It was a different conceptual world right i mean do, do, do people buy into that or is it the people go yeah it was a bit but fighting is fighting and it's real and it's the same tradition or yeah yeah well usually usually they they're into this direction of thought but um i mean you can like in every martial arts culture and you would encounter different different perspectives and different different positions but i always try to argue that i mean we have to we have to this is also why the martial arts studies research network is for me as a as a medievalist so important because this is for me a way to adjust my my ways of thinking about martial arts and is it really martial arts that we are encountering here in the fight books and i would say well i came i came from from trying to research martial arts in the middle ages and now i'd say i'm looking at fighting practices which is more basic um and by saying well i look at the the moment or the the practice when fighting practices become a discursive object and when fighting practices become the object of a learned culture they write books on fighting they try to well to make out the the body techniques uh, that you use for fighting they try to 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 establish didactics of fighting mm -hmm. and then put them down which is basically which is for me also a minimal definition of what martial arts is so it's about fighting practices um, and it's about people organizing their knowledge on fighting um, by associating with each other, by like forming schools or like uh, having having a, a, a common practice of training and talking about fighting, um, which would my general like minimal definition of martial arts. Um, so I, I try to do a bottom up approach instead of a top down uh, approach. Um, and I think at the end I come up with something is like, well, how the, the martial arts culture, and I think we can definitely say there was a martial arts culture in the Middle Ages, mm -hmm. um, because they also named the, what they were doing, this, this was art. So they said, this is Kunst des Fechten, this, this is the art of fencing or the art of fighting, um, and which is pretty much the same. It's, it's a way to turn this into, uh, well, an object of a learned culture. And um, yeah, uh, pretty much this. So I try to I try to come from both ways. Like um, top down would be martial arts. Our today's um, well concepts of martial arts. From this perspective, I look on the Middle Ages, but also the other way up um, to say, well, people thought people thought about fighting. People wrote books about fighting. People wrote about body techniques, uh, and um, yeah, it's like a, like this from from two angles. I try to approach approach this uh, phenomenon. Okay, so. Um, I mean, in, in the modern world, people um, indulge in martial arts practices or they turn to them for a range of reasons. I mean, Six Wetzler has, has said there's, there's like five or six almost mm -hmm. almost universal reasons why, why people turn to martial arts for like sport or preparation for conflict or self-defense or for spiritual or for health or for mm -hmm. uh, something else that I can't remember. But I mean, are these the... So in, if we're talking 14th to 16th century, I mean, who is it who's who's turning to these teachers and who is it who is, is it the aristocracy? Is it, uh, is it you know, serfs and villains? And who, I mean, who is it who, who turns to these, these schools and these teachers? Yeah, um, well, 
that's what I like about the 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 ideas that Six and also Ben uh, Ben Judkins put forward. Like, why would you train martial arts? What are the the um, the the reasons? Um, I think it's pretty much the same in the Middle Ages. So you have like people from different social strata engaged with martial training practices. Um, of course, you have the nobles um, who would usually, I mean, they would have. Um, their own people who are competent in fighting who would teach uh, their, their young knights and so on in fighting so these show up sometimes in court records as like fencing masters or so but these are not the same guys who are who are writing the fight books i guess i think i, I mean we don't know this for sure yet because there's still so much research to be done um, but I'd say the, these fight the the whole the most of the body of the fight books belongs to an urban environment. So it's burghers fighting, uh, it's burghers and craftsmen fighting. Um, you also have like in the 15th century you have the um, several guilds guild structures who arise like uh, there are brotherhoods uh, of fighting masters who would also like get in, in 1487 they would get the imperial privilege in the holy roman empire from from the um, um the the emperor to um give the title master of the sword so this is like yeah they have the the only right to give the black belt in in sword fighting um and you have to pay for it and you have to get um you have to make some sort of a graduation ceremony and show your your skills um so this is really much like a really established martial arts culture in the 15th century um but i i'd say i mean we have fighting practices and people training for fighting in different strata of the society you have like in 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 fairs or markets they you would have like wrestling matches or stuff like that so i think it's hard to tell because it's it's all fused together mm. it's and that's what I, what i try to 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 show in my in my book that um i don't want to say it's it's like today's martial arts culture, but I'd say it's so varied and it's so, so many people fought and trained for fighting for so many reasons. It's so polysemic um, that you, you really try to, you, you have to write a book on it because it's so fascinating. And then you can like, try to, to show the links between today's martial arts culture and that martial arts culture, but this doesn't mean that it's the same. It's a whole complex universe. But um, I mean, it's, we can find many, many similarities, I'd say. Okay, so here's another question which you, you, you may not um, have thought about. I'm, I'm sure you probably have actually, but um, so I know that I, I haven't read any of the fight books, but I've read about them. I've read lots about them. Um, and I know there's a there's often a kind of cultural conflict between like the Italian style and mm. then there's the English style and and people are kind of very dismissive about certain types of blade and certain types yeah. of sword that people are using and it's it becomes very kind of cultural and local does how far does that stretch does it stretch outside of Europe or is it is it a, is it on the European circuit mm. where people are kind of like yeah don't do his style do my style but mm. but it, does it go does it go North Africa does it go I mean how far around the world do people dispute and discuss different styles of swordsmanship or different logics of battle or something like that that's a great question and i have no answer for it so um i, I can't find this in the fight books so I th in, in the fight books it's most like uh, most likely to be a european thing i guess but i mean there is there is there are records of like um, portuguese sword masters in, encountering japanese sword masters and stuff like that and there, there must have been i mean where there's fighting, people would, would also think about how the others fight or how how you learn to fight. How I think there, anytime you have like professionals engaging with each other, they would have some sort of mm. thinking going on, or also some sort of exchange going on. Maybe some someone yeah they they tried this out. I don't know. So um, this is I think this is a part of martial arts and f fight book culture which still has to be researched. Um, yeah. It'd be yeah. hard to research it'd probably be around yeah. travelers tales and marco polo yeah. and magellan yeah. and stuff like that yeah i mean they, they wouldn't they wouldn't talk that much the, the funny thing about the fight books is it's the first time they really take the time to write about fighting in in detail because usually in in the other sources except from some literary sources where it's quite graphic and quite quite interesting to read about the fighting it's just well they fought it's no one no one cares how exactly they use their bodies in fighting so this is also why these sources are so interesting for me because it's the first time you can put the finger on it you can say well yeah um they, they thought about how to use the body and they they took the time to write it down um and yeah this is this is special 
So, um, I, but I think sixth, I, ta I talked about this with sixth, um, who told me about something like British, British soldiers encountering uh, in India, people who also fought with uh, some sort of scimitar-like stuff and who, who wrote a lot about this. So this, but this is 18th century, I guess. Um, so then you would have like these cultural, cultural fighting styles. Um, but um, in the Middle Ages, I have nothing, nothing. Uh, so far, I haven't seen anything yet. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. Okay, so you, so you say this is all book-length stuff. I mean, tell us, tell us about your books. You've, you've written mm. one. You're writing another. I mean, tell us about. Tell, tell us your publication history <laughs> okay yeah well i i wrote my my phd thesis was uh, not about fighting my phd thesis was about uh, discourse analysis on crusading discourse in late medieval europe so um, dukes of burgundy crusading self-fashioning stuff like that and um yeah now i'm writing my second book which is on fighting on the fight books and uh, all, still the middle ages um, and yeah, I've, uh, I started this project when I was working in Dresden. So I had a research project on single combat in, uh, in the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. I spent that two years and this was like the I first came across these fight books um, as a researcher and thought, well, yeah, I have to stick with this. this these are so interesting sources. You can do so much with it. You can attach so many um, yeah, views and angles uh, to, these, to these. You can ask so many questions uh, with these sources. Um, that's why I wanted to stick with them, and yeah, well, and after the second book, I don't think about uh, about uh, the time after the second book. Just uh, <laughs> have to finish it beforehand. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm going to hand in a grant application now, um, which basically gives me the freedom to um, do all the research which is still necessary for the second book. So I want to go to to Augsburg uh, in order to to research in uh, the public archives of the city. Um, and I hope to do some sort of a micro micro historical study on Augsburg in the same period I'm looking at um, as for the fight books um, in order to to like establish the background of these fight books. So like look at how people fought, what sorts of fights did they encounter? What was the what was the the background for writing fight books? So what what fighting practices were they? How, how can I tell? Um, in order to not just be on the discursive discursive level and just look at how people thought about fighting, how, how they wrote about fighting, but also to look at well, what, what did actually happen and to what, what is the the background for these these ideas about fighting? Okay, so um, and after you've done that, will this be this this is you and fight books finished forever, or or do you think no this, no no, no lifelong? Never. <laughs> no, I, I'm. I mean, martial arts studies and fight books. I guess they will with me. Will be with me the rest of my academic career if there is one. <laughs> because after, after, I mean, you know how it is. After this, after this second book, um, it's it's the watershed. You have to dis, uh, dis decide, or you have to see whether you get a professorship or not. So I'm still at the the postdoc status, and uh, yeah, we'll see where it goes. But um, I still think in these. I, th I think I'm. I'm still. I'm a cultural historian, I'd say. So I'm interested in theory and the way people people establish, I don't know, people think about their world. Like this is the main part, and um, I will continue to think in this direction. So you you have you have a very broad kind of historical and theoretical um, framework. So if anyone out there is hiring, uh... <laughs> 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 okay. So I, I mean, I wanted to ask you about um, a little, just a tiny bit more about the. Um, the, the possibilities for researching around the books because the sense that I have and I'm not a, a proper historian at all of anything you know I could never I wouldn't know how to look that far back in time um, I mean what other textual or archival or even archaeological I don't what other kinds of evidence and what other kinds of material are you able to work with if you're looking at the period of time that you're interested in it seems like sources are quite thin on the ground in terms of things to back things anecdotally backing things up or or through other material what kind of other stuff do you use well i want to use the whole the whole spectrum that's possible so i would like to um use on the one hand i would like to use literary sources which all i mean the, these are all fields which have sometimes been done so i can just build up on this 
but um, I wanted to engage with literary sources because uh, that's also what Six Vetsta did in this thesis. He looked at the way um, like uh, sagas describe fighting and um, the way they in included like special terms on fighting techniques and stuff like that. This would be interesting for me. So um, how how deep does this go? How, how far can I trace martial culture and martial arts culture in the literary genre? Because they tried to do, they started to write romances and stuff like that much earlier than the fight books, which might be nice, uh, nice indicators for um, a training culture if there's already specialized specialized terms for techniques and, and a, a feeling for how to perform technique. Mm -hmm. um, this is one thing uh, I want to work with work with uh, archival sources. This is pretty much the, the study I want to do on Augsburg. So like you could could work with legal sources, which what sort of carrying a sword or doing stuff was prohibited, which 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 uh, which infractions did occur, how were they punished, um, what happened on the streets, maybe brawls, or how would, yeah, how would how would the city try to keep the peace, which is also um, quite interesting. So for example, if you look at, this is not the case for Augsburg, but for other, other cities, if you would look at um, cities with universities, they would usually uh, limit the, or they would, um, they would not allow students to attend fight schools, because I mean, you have these, uh, youths like uh, who are prone to violence a little so you could say so they, and if they attend fight schools this tends to to endanger public order mm -hmm. um, and you would also have attempts to control the the carry of weapons uh, and stuff like that so this is also interesting as as a general uh, fighting culture mm -hmm. um, and you could also look at um, at like chronicles um, to to determine different yeah um contexts of fighting for example you have the judicial duel um which was part of the the legal process to to uh, settle a course and uh, you would then have a fight which was usually also um well a, a fencing master would train the opponents like every opponent would have its own fencing master of course but um they would act in the in the in this process as some sort of legal advice i'd say to train the the opponents in a judicial duel and i mean you can find like it, there are not many records of these so they didn't happen that often but you can find descriptions in chronicles how these duels were fought mm -hmm. and this is also interesting because the 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 judicial duel is also very um, common feature in the fight book so they would often talk about how to because obviously these fencing masters were also looking to be applied as some sort of professional um, fencing master in in such a case so they would show you in their books i'm capable of teaching you all that you know in order to win in a judicial duel so um yeah it's it's a it's a you can work with lots of sources and i try to and also material i like i, I mean um I mean, just um, the artifacts you would have. I was um, with Daniel Jacquet. We we visited uh, we visited a Zeug house and we saw a fencing sword, which was made only to imitate the physical properties of a real sword, but with a blunt edge and with uh, a different distribution of mass, so that you could train safely. And this is like 15th century, 16th century. You can't really tell, but I mean, they they had like specialized expensive objects in order to train long sword fighting without using sharp long swords and this also tells you a lot i think about training practices and uh, and also the status of martial arts practice so th th this was would not cost a fortune but it was still expensive and they had this in order to train safely so and it um, also it also connects you very much with the present doesn't it i mean i've noticed that i mean some maybe we maybe uh, some of us have uh, an image of historians as people who have this stuffy like obsessive knowledge about somewhere dis somewhere in the past somewhere but but in terms of because for you this is so connected to contemporary practices too and they don't so much mirror each other as they communicate imaginatively with each other that that you're as engaged with contemporary questions of of, of training and fighting and combat and dueling and and self-defense and, and performance and so on and all of these issues uh, and trans all cultural translation the question of establishing knowledge from the past i mean it's almost like even though your focus is on is is on ancient history it, not ancient history but history <laughs> um it it it, it really uh, invigorates and and gives life to your thinking about contemporary culture as well yeah. i mean in a really unique way 
Yeah, but the, for me, this is, I, I think this is also, I, I love this about this research. And this also changes my way of thinking about history because I think this is, um, history is, I mean, we are history. <laughs> yeah? So there, there is no history if you don't look back. Um, so you need someone to look back. And the, the way you do this is, well, it determines the way history is. And for me, history is a contemporary practice. So history is nothing which was back then. History is the way we are engaging with the remains of the past and the, the questions we ask. And the funny thing about this research is that it, it, it enables me to, well, to, to, well, to really see where my questions come from, to, to make, make comparisons on, on different levels. But I think this isn't the same with all kinds of history. It's just, I call this um, the, the fetish character of the historic object, because um, if, you're, if you're only obsessed with the past as a historian, um, you tend to forget that, that this past is just existing in your head because you are you're you're engaging with the, the with the sources um and i think this is this is a way for me to keep to keep yeah to keep it really vibrant and and really really a communication from from all it's just in my head so for me science <laughs> i could make this I, i'm a radical constructivist in the end so i could make this all up um, yeah. But um, history, history is, is the way we communicate. Uh, history is nothing in itself. But I think that, I, I mean, I've, I've been reading uh, a lot of um, Peter Sloterdijk recently, mm -hmm. and um, I don't know how, how much or if any you've read, but it, it's no. really interesting. And I think it will become really interesting because, I mean, I'm obsessively writing all the connections I'm making between his philosophy and martial arts mm -hmm. and, and a couple of things that he writes about and it's a theme that keeps coming back through his work is is um is our relationship with the ancient mm -hmm. and and he he talks about the way in which we can reimagine the ancient and we have to just ignore the differences so like he says the European renaissance just completely forgot the vast differences between their time and and the Hellenic Greek mm -hmm ancient past that they imagined they had a connection to mm -hmm. and that that was a process of reinvention it's like this one it doesn't matter about the differences like mm -hmm. you know they invented the ancient for mm -hmm. themselves in the present and that that works and this immediately always brings me to practices like HEMA you know the way in which HEMA is actually a comparatively recent practice like a comparatively recent hobby right for, yeah. for, for like battle reconstruction and, and being in but it's because of a, a, an imagined relation to a past that we then want to think is continuous and unbroken, but we've just made it up now. But it, it, it says something about where we are now, doesn't yeah. it? it? Our interest in it says something about us and, our, and where we yeah. think we are in the world. Yeah. yeah, I would totally agree. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, on that, just, on that I mean, bombshell, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I think I've, I've killed that topic. So, uh, but I know that you're busy and and you have a busy day. So I just want to say, Eric Burkhardt, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Thank you. It was great fun, Paul. Thanks. <laughs>